Very Wednesday. different cards. Yes. Uh, Who thought? Absolutely. But uh, anyway, it looks like we're off to the races. Players are picking up their opening hands. On the right of your screen, you're going to see Robin Hartshorn with his Maverick deck. On the left, you'll have Sean Ryan with his Reanimator deck. Sean actually got second in the last Star City Game Seattle last year. Um, I was there commentating. He ended up losing out to Ben Swartz, who was playing Hive Mind. But then he was playing No Bant. But this time, he's decided to put away the fair cards and pick up the unfair yeah, absolutely. ones. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, if there's any format to do that, it's Legacy. Right. <clears throat> We've seen um, a lot of times, like Reanimator last year was all Jenga Taxi, as you know, there was no Gristlebrand. Right. Uh, and now, with the addition of Gristlebrand kind of replacing Jenga Taxi, you know, I, I still like the idea of both. You know, maybe just Jenga Taxi as a one of, maybe a 3 1 split kind of thing. Maybe four Gristlebrands and a Jenga Taxi. It feels to me like, you know, being able to stick a Jenga Taxi, if they, they have a super small window to answer it, and, uh, and then they're pretty locked out of the game. So, yep. not R present in uh, Sean's deck, though. Yeah. Robin leads on uh, Savannah, but has no play but back that. Yeah, so besides four Gristle Brands, Sean also has an Iona, an Elshnorn, and a Tide Spout Tyrant. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, a very interesting uh, choice there. So, a slow early couple turns. Sean plays Blue to Delta, Robin plays a second land, and out comes Talia. Now that is, uh, that actually could present something of a problem for the reanimator deck. They, uh, there's not a lot of lands. How many is it over there? 17? Yeah. 5, 9, 12, 18 lands. 18, yeah. Usually that's about right for, uh, for a reanimator deck. I think the, my mind runs 17, but you know, it's light on lands. It runs on just a few lands, but Thalia is going to really uh, make, you know, all of those reanimation spells, all those uh, careful studies and brainstorms and ponders just cost one more unless he can find an answer and uh, it looks like you know there's there's not a lot of removal either in the reanimator decks so right although Sean has a window right here he cast into in response to the Thalia is going to go get uh, gristle brand presumably into his graveyard maybe Iona and then if he untaps and just has reanimate he can just cast it right yeah it play. Yeah, as long as he has a land right uh, he has a land as long drop, as he has yeah. a land that's always tricky once again with only 18 lands yeah and there's gristle brand Heading into the graveyard, the absent restored nemesis, seeing some, seeing some play. That's a one powerful card, and it's kind of interesting to see a card from absent restored making such a huge impact in legacy. It's, you know, a lot of times a new set will come out, and maybe you'll see a card here or there, but Gristlebrand is certainly one of the hot topics of the legacy community. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's interesting. Just over the past, you know, year or two, how much the the sets have been having an impact. I mean, newer sets have been having an impact. On uh, on legacy, but here so, uh, Sean actually finds a force of will for Thalia, or had but, a force of will. No, but Robin played Cabin of Souls and tapped it for the Talia, so he just wasted a force of will. That's a good question. He named. He, uh, you might have just forgot he entombed it in response, and you know, like he did a bunch of shuffling. Yeah, so he wow. just threw away a force of will and a ponder. Wow, I didn't even realize that that he had named uh, he had played the Thalia that way. Yeah, yeah. Robin dropped Cabin of Souls, put named human. And then Talia came out, so, wow. Yeah, so, uh, you know, that's interesting. I guess it's, you know, it's legal to try to counter them. Yeah. You can yeah. attempt, it just doesn't actually work. Right, I mean, with Force of Will, it's particularly brutal because you had to pitch a ponder, too, to do it. So, so seeing if Sean can overcome that, that would be pretty impressive. Like, I just <laughs> threw away Force of Will Didn't for no reason. It. Force of Will and a ponder and a life. Just, you know. Not relevant. Don't need all right, so now Robin's going to tap those two and play a scavenging ooze. Decidedly not a human, but Sean will opt to not counter it. And Thalia comes in crashing, dropping Sean's life total to 16. Yeah, so just as I was saying, like, new cards. There's scavenging ooze. Came out last right. summer in the commander decks. There's Thalia. Just came out a few months ago. Uh, and then Gristlebrand is in the graveyard as, you know, the creature in Legacy right now. Um, these are all new cards. And Gristlebrand gets nommed up by that scavenging ooze. Yeah, and that is something that I don't know that... Uh, I don't know that Sean can get back into this game very easily where Thalia resolved, Scavenging Ooze resolved. There's just so much working against him right now. Yeah, and I see an animate dead in Sean's hand, but yeah, that Force Will was so brutal because he could have forced that Scavenging Ooze and kept the Gristlebrand in his graveyard, but because he threw it away on the Thalia, he doesn't have that option. And yeah, the, the, this turn, if he had drawn a land, he could have reanimated that Gristlebrand. So. Yeah, I think uh, he, I believe he has force, but I don't think he has blue card. Well, now he may, but yeah. I, I don't think he had blue card when uh, Scavenging Ooze was cast. I think he had force, though. Right, right. But if he if he had not forced the, the Thalia... Yeah, he, he would have... Act, you're right, you're right. 
Um, Sean go opts for a main phase brainstorm here, putting two cards back on top and just passing the turn, no land drop, which means probably middle no lands for a couple turns, because that's yeah. how brainstorm unfortunately works. It certainly is always the dagger when you have to put two non-lands on top and you know your mana screwed. And facing down Athalia, that's not good news. I guess there's a possibility that Sean has a ponder that's going to allow him to shuffle, but I don't see it. I, I see Animate Dead, uh, Elish Norn, maybe another Entomb, I think. Animate, so Animate Dead, Elish Norn, Entomb. Can't quite see what else. It's kind of yeah. dark. But. And Entomb is not going to get the job done against Scavenging News. No, he's going to have to... Uh, He's gonna have to find like a window to cast both Entomb and a reanimation spell when uh, when Robin doesn't have access to green mana. Yeah, yeah Robin yeah. drawing one of his two scavenging uses was completely brutal there. And there's a Stoneforge Mystic coming down from Robin. Looks like his targets are Gite, Fire, and Fire and Ice. I imagine he's gonna go get G or Fire and Ice here. Oh no, he gets Gite. Okay. Either one's pretty brutal. <laughs> Oh yeah, either one is certainly very good. I guess he can cast the GTA this turn using his two mana and then equip it next turn. I just, like, the, the minus one minus one off the GTA isn't that relevant, and the plus one plus one, and the two left is not that relevant, and the plus two plus two is mitigated by, uh, is mitigated by the fact that Sword of Fire Knights could just be dealing more damage, but he goes for the GTA here. Maybe he already has Sword in his hand. Thought is in Sean Ryan's hand, so he can do that, but if he does that, he's dead. That, that's his turn, and he... He's at nine, and then, I mean, he's, it's looking bad for him right now. Yeah, yeah, I do already. not see Sean coming back. Especially, we know the top two cards of his deck are not lands, and they're scavenging who's in play. Yeah, Sean is a longtime Legacy player from the area, and has played a ton of Legacy, and he just might not be as familiar with the brand new card, Cavern of Souls, and, you know, hasn't played against it. Yeah, and there he is, packs in the cards, and so yeah. ended up, you know, forcing away that, uh, that ponder to ca try and counter Athalia that he couldn't was, you know, that was a game breaker. Yeah, that's pretty brutal. And um, you know, I would like to know, like, what Sean thinks of that. That he is, he is he thinking, oh man, I made a mistake, or oh, I totally didn't realize it had aimed human, or you know, like I, is where was the miscommunication? Was it a, was it Sean's error? Was there just, you know, not did he just completely forget? There was a lot of shuffling, like you said. Right. Well, yeah, um, he has intuitive response. I might have forgotten. So let's go to sideboards here. Yeah. Let's start by looking at Sean. He's down a game. He's going to be looking to turn that around. He's got a uh, pithy needle. Probably not going to come in. I don't think that does enough. Works well against Knight of the Reliquary. Um, he knows he's playing against Maverick. Right. And Knight I guess is damaging is too. Th yeah, and see, actually, that's more likely. Um, but maybe it doesn't do enough. I, I, I'm right. with you there. Um, I, I, I could see bringing a couple. He's got three. I don't know if you're going to want all three, though. Okay, I'm with Co you there. Coffin Purge, probably not. No. Uh, wipe Away, probably not. I mean, mm. it could do something that Pit and Needle does, where you get to pick up their, their scavenging ooze and then try and go off. But for three mana, it's a little it's slow. It's not that great, yeah. Especially if you have to fight against Thalia, you know, that's four mana. City of Traders, now that's really interesting. It allows Sean to uh, board in some lands so he can just go off quicker some games because he's going to have these four show and tells if he mm -hmm. wants them. And I think those come in side by side in a way. The City of Traders giving, uh, giving him just that little bit of extra uh, mana and right. acceleration at the same time. Uh, like we said, he only runs 18 lands and show and tell being a little bit more expensive than most of the reanimation spells he's trying to, uh, he was trying to cast game one. Do you, we think Sean's going to go for the show and tell plan after sideboarding? Uh, I think that's kind of a natural inclination for uh, for reanimator decks, and I think um, and I think against Maverick, it's not you know w what is Maverick going to drop into play that's going to be a as big or as threatening as something that you're going to show and tell into play. You don't play show and tell and you know put a animate dead into play. Really, do you? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like right, uh, right. So yeah, I mean I think show and tell is reasonable, especially because <laughs> if we think that uh, Robin's going to be fighting on the graveyard axis, scavenging oozes and stuff like that. You just show in a Gristlebrand and right. you know, that's that. And even if they do, go ahead and show in like a knight that could be fairly huge or uh, a scavenging ooze. Like the, the damage is kind of done. Like scavenging ooze doesn't do much to a Gristlebrand that's already in play. Right. The, Removing it from the graveyard, sure. The, the, the knight kind of does. You can search up uh, Caracas. Right. Bounce it, but Sean can still draw seven cards. Right, exactly. An you can answer the uh, the Caracas or the knight before the knight is actually online. Uh, and then the other two cards on Sean's sideboard, Gilded Drake, not going to come in, I don't think. I mean, you could trade it for another real query, I guess. But, I don't even know that that's worth it. But you know? yeah, it seems like a, you just want to be a streamlined combo, and that's mm -hmm. probably not going to do the trick. Blazing Archon, I think, will probably come in. Yeah, keeping, uh, keeping Robin from being able to even... 
attack is uh, is huge because that's how Robin needs to win. He's right. not he's not winning through another uh, another means. Right. And now Robin does have some swords, the, the plowshares, but you know still if you just play Blazing Archon and have Force of Will, it could be right. a, a rough road for uh, for him. Let's look at Robin's sideboard now. He, he has an Enlightened Tutor package. He's got two Enlightened Tutors. His targets are Crucible of Worlds, Wheel of Sun and Moon, Graph Digger's Cage, and Snaring Bridge, Drexian Revoker, and Ethersworn Cannon. So I, I imagine he's going to bring in the Tutors and probably Wheel of Sun and Moon and Graph Digger's Cage. Yeah, Wheel of Sun and Moon's interesting. It just keeps things from hitting the graveyard. Basically, if they would go to the graveyard, they go to the bottom of the player's right. library instead. So. Uh, all these, you know, entomb. It kind of just you just make their entombs into dead cards. Right. The entomb becomes the shuffle your library. Put a card on the bottom. Yeah. Uh, Frexian Revoker uh, could be okay just as a card you could bring in. Mm -hmm. So you just like you know put it down and name Gristlebrand. You just buy yourself some time potentially. Right. Um, after that, I guess he's got a Bajuka Bog to search up with the knight. That's mm -hmm. huge. Graph Digger's Cage. Yeah, the cage will come in for the tutor. Other than that, I don't really see a lot. He get, or actually, he's got two crop rotations. Maybe those come in so you can search up uh, Just to get the Caracas, yeah. Yeah, I could totally see that happening. And Snaring Bridge uh, seems like a reasonable idea because of how, uh, how large all those creatures are that Sean is playing. We also got handed uh, the standings and the metagame breakdown, and it looks like the top eight is, or the Potential top eight is a lot of interesting decks. Alluren probably yeah. just drew in the top eight, which is we, pretty exciting. Just, Belcher probably yeah. just drew in the top eight. Blue White Miracles probably drew in the top yeah, eight. I'm kind of surprised we're not doing that match. <laughs> probably <laughs> because he drew. Right, right. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, presumably he drew. I, he might not have, I guess. I haven't done the math on that. Yeah. This, but. We're just uh, looking at the top. Stoneblade yeah. with red is it top eight contention. So that, going straight down from the top, it's uh, first is Rug Delver, second is Merfolk, third is Alluren, fourth is Reanimator. Re Fifth is Belcher, sixth is Blue White Miracle, seventh Sneak and Show, eighth Maverick, ninth Maverick, tenth Stoneblade, eleventh Reanimator, twelfth Merfolk, thirteenth Maverick, fourteenth Blue Red Delver. So what is that? Three Maverick, two or three Merfolk, and then a bunch of oh, like a couple of Reanimators. It uh, looks like, two, yeah, three Mavericks. Three Mavericks, two Merfolks, I think. Uh, Which is interesting that they're Merfolk. that Merfolk is showing up again. Yeah, Merfolk is always somewhat popular in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the legacy meta game. So I'm not not too surprised to see it being played. But at the top tables is, is kind of an interesting. Right. Um, might might have just been a good meta game call for today with all the decks right. that were out there. You know, if people are trying to sneak and show in, maybe Merfolk is good against that. Um, all right. So it looks like we're going to be kicking off here. Uh, and Verdant Catacomb searches up an underground sea for Sean, trying to get off to the races and get to a better start than the last game. All right, and there's no Careful cut. Study. And I see Blazing Archon already in Sean's hand, and he yep. draws what, uh, sneak Ponder and Show and Tell? Yeah, snow, Show and Tell. I wanted to call it Sneak and Show. <laughs> sneak and Snow and Tell. <laughs> um, all right. So... Snow and Tell. That sounds like the next Wizards Holiday yes. card, right? <laughs> Snow and Tell. I snowed and lived to tell about it. <laughs> so he's looking at what to discard. I see a Gristlebrand in his hand, another careful study, a reanimate. So he's got an interesting choice. He can either hold on to his fatties and try and show and tell them into play, or he can discard them here and go for the turn two reanimate. If Robin doesn't have anything, he's in good shape. If Robin does have something, that could be a problem. So a hard decision for Sean Ryan. What does he want to do? Or he can discard one fatty and try and hedge his bats. Right. Uh, I do see there's a Gristlebrand, there's a Blazing Archon. Yeah, and he's got to reanimate, careful study. Does he play Iona? I can't yeah, remember he, if he I saw plays it. Iona. I kind of see a white card in there. Okay, so he goes with uh, Tidespout Tyrant and Gristlebrand wow. going to the graveyard. And he, Robin wants to read Tidespout Tyrant. He, he had the whole collection of fatties there. He did. I guess that was why the turn one careful study was, you know, immediately cast. Or, right. You know, the careful study was cast right away turn one. You want to try to get some of those guys out of your hand, turn them into some different cards. And, um, you know, it is kind of cool. Like, he, I believe, still, ha you know, he has Blazing Archon in hand. We know that. And Show and Tell. So he, if Robin wants to fight his graveyard, Sean's got a backup. Uh, if Robin can't fight the graveyard, maybe Sean decides he wants to, uh, well, he's going to have trouble <laughs> for the moment, but maybe Sean decides he wants to go ahead and reanimate something. All right, so uh, Robin wastelands away the Underground Sea. Now, Sean needs a land to reanimate, but there's no land forthcoming. He even has a Brainstorm in his grip, but he can't cast it. No lands. So now is Robin's kind of opening. If Sean draws a 
black source, he can reanimate and take control of the game, but he has to do that before Robin gets a guy online, and we're going to see what's going to happen here. Looks like Robin cracks a land getting a savannah. See what he's got access to. Now, the fact that Robin didn't play like a Graph Digger's Cage or something kind of tells me that, and it opted a Wasteland on turn one instead, mm -hmm. kind of tells me that he doesn't have any of this hate in his hand, because otherwise I think he would have went for that. Yeah, um, I agree. He does have Caracas. Oh, he does like. have Caracas. That is huge. Yeah. So if Sean uh, reanimates Crystal Brand, he could draw seven cards, but it might still get bounced. There's Noble Hierarch. Sean is just going to be looking for a black source. Is it a black source? It is not. All right. It's something that is not a black source. Now he gets to discard here, I think, or is, he, is that seven? It looks like se it looks seven. Looks like seven. Cards. Okay. All right. Now Robin's going to. Oh, he drew Craft Digger's Cage. Brutal. This is. Yeah. This be the end of Reanimator? We'll see. All right, so Robin thinks about playing that Caracas, but besides to keep it in his hand, you know, doesn't need to show it off before he needs to. Absolutely, yeah. There's no reason. I mean, Caracas is. Uh, I'm sorry, Gristlebrand. If it hits the table, it's going to draw seven cards anyway. All right, and there's then, a Thalia from Robin, which is going to cause nightmares for Sean. Ryan. Yeah, we saw what it did game one, and now Sean has absolutely no lands. He doesn't have an answer to Thalia. All right, so he draws the lands. Yeah, a turn too late. Yep, a turn too late. And Robin hasn't played his Graph Digger's Cage yet. I guess waiting, um, figuring, well, Sean can't do anything when I've got Thalia in play anyway. Yeah, so we might see the cage, cage here. Yeah, it might just cage There's it There's Caracas. All so right. he says, I dare you to go after Gristlebrand. The temple is out of the bag. All right. And, scavenging. Oh, scavenging oh. goes too. Oh, wow. my gosh. What a draw. So he's got not only Grafticker's Cage, but Thalia and Scavenging Ooze to back it up. And yeah. Caracas, in case something actually does hit the table. Right. <laughs> At this point, Sean can basically, uh, you know, forget about Gristlebrand. Right. So he, he's got Show and Tell in his hand, but he's still three more lands away from casting that. And considering he's trying to draw lands off the top, that's going to be difficult. If he draws one, I guess he could brainstorm and try and find those lands, but... It's going to be a rough road for Sean Ryan here. Not a Draws a Thoughtseize. That's not going to do it. And I think the clock now has outpaced his chance of victory. Scavenging is sitting as a 4-4. Uh, He's got a Thalia, which is a 2-1. So that, he can attack in for 6, drop Ryan to Sean to 10. Yeah, that's not going to do it. I think Sean is dead. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate. Like, he, he just that small stumble, and then Thalia really takes, takes advantage of that, really punishes players for stumbling on their mana and... Um, Especially decks like this that can't do anything uh, unless they cast non-creature spells. Right. Yeah, Legacy is so po has such a high density of non-creature spells, but so populated by them that a card like Thalia just pinpoints attack those decks. And it's okay in standard. It's seen maybe some standard play, mm -hmm. but in Legacy and modern is where it really, really shines. I think even Vintage. I think I might have seen a Thalia hanging out in there too. So. All right. So. Robin taps three and brings out Knight of Reliquary. Yeah, keeping the pressure on. Next turn, that's it. Like, yeah. if Robin gets another attack step, that's it. Yeah, I just can't see Sean going back. Sean looks, oh, yeah. finds an island, all right, so he's going to try to hold on. That's going to be much too late, I think. So, you know, yeah, and that's, that's it. it. Sean, Sean extends the hand. Looks like Maverick going to have at least one Maverick deck in our top eight, and judging by the standings, Probably maybe even two Maverick decks yeah, in the top Yeah, there eight. were three in, a, in what we mentioned, right? So, uh, yeah, there's uh, Ian Kendall playing. Oh, that's Merfolk, sorry. It's uh, Samuel Moniz playing yep. Maverick. Uh, Joshua Sarad's on Merfolk. I keep seeing Merfolk and thinking it says Maverick at first. <laughs> so we have uh, Dan Baker and Robin Hartshorn on, both on Maverick. So, wow. very uh, Maverick's a popular deck. I'm not surprised at all to see it, uh, see it at the top tables. In some uh, in some number. Yeah, Maverick is popular and it keeps doing well. It's funny, a lot of people make fun of it because it's like mm. green white beatdown and legacy. Like yeah. you'd be killing your opponent on turn two, but yet it keeps putting up good results because of all that disruption. We saw that mm -hmm. game how it was able to beat a turn two combo deck, right? You have Thalia, which shows slows them down. You have some disruption like scavenging ooze. You have to draw it at the right time. Game one can be rough sometimes, mm -hmm. but I mean he had all the right pieces. Yeah, I think uh, it's it's kind of like he already is built to deal with graveyard somewhat. I mean, a lot of Maverick decks, main deck, one Bajuka Bog, right. which is already, you know, just, there's so many decks that it, that's even good against the mirror, you know, uh, decks with Tarmogoyf or uh, reanimator decks, you know, like being able to knight up a Bajuka Bog is pretty awesome. Like just 
just there. That's main deck sometimes, uh, in a lot of cases. So I think Maverick just has a great matchup against graveyard-based strategies. And then when the graveyard deck tries to compensate by going shifting to show and tell, Thalia is there to say, well, you, you can show and tell on turn four right. if, you see, yeah. if you hit four land drops. Uh, on turn four, maybe, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. at best, you can show and tell on turn four. Or it just forces them to have something like force of will. That, that, that's a bit and, of a stretch. So, I mean, we can look down the, the standings here. I am trying to figure out exactly how this all breaks down. I think what happens is, all right, so we, there's Rug Delvin for sure. He's got 21 points. Okay. okay, yeah, so he's in. And I think the, the first couple 18-pointers can probably draw. So I think we'll probably see Joshua Sarad playing Merfolk. Jo Josh always plays Merfolk. So yeah. he uh, <laughs> bringing his pet deck here, or pet as in, you know, Merfolk. It's not exactly a pet deck, but it's mm. a popular deck that hasn't seen a lot of play recently. He's bringing it here, ends up in top eight probably. Martin Golden Kirst, an excellent, excellent player, played on the Pro Tour multiple times, playing Alluren, very exciting, probably in top eight. Might get to see some Alluren on camera, which I'm sure will be exciting. Uh, yeah, we actually did see it earlier. I, oh, I've watched yeah. it now twice. I watched him just out there in the Swiss in the early rounds, I think round one or two. And uh, then we got to see it in round three, the first match we covered. And um, Marshall was talking, uh, talking about how good of a player Martin is and um, saying about how, you know, he's like a PTQ end boss kind of uh, oh, around here. And, um, and I'm thinking, well, if, if he's that good, and this deck, nobody's fighting a Lurin. Nobody's, you know, prepared for a Lurin. And uh, I, I can totally see him taking this down, especially now knowing that he's in contention for top eight or probably just in, uh, in uh, on 18 points with, you know, the pretty good tiebreakers, it looks like. Yeah, he's, you know, second 18-pointer. I feel like he's probably in good shape. A Lurin, I don't know if Martin's played it very much, the Lurin deck. Yeah. But one of his big abilities is to pick up a deck and just play it. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one point where he top aided three consecutive PTQs, I think, with three different decks. Wow. Which is really impressive. Yeah. Um, the man can play some magic. Of course, he's also not against finding his own deck. He played a, a Bant deck and uh, extended for a while and just kept winning with it. But, you know, so he can just pick up a deck and start playing it. And with something as complicated as a Lurin, that is a huge boon to have. Yeah, now... Uh I was only vaguely familiar with a learn. Like I got the concept, and there was there was the one piece that I couldn't remember in the parasitic strix. I'm like, how does it win? It's something <laughs> like tendrils, and I can't remember what it is. And it's the the parasitic strix. But uh, so I'm like, I, when I saw it being played, I'm like, oh, let me watch this so I could remember that what that last piece is. And I'm watching, and he goes off, and I'm like, I'm like standing there, and I look at Twitter, and I look up, and the head already scooped. I'm like, ah, I missed it. <laughs> it's, so I always love it when cards like parasitic strix are getting played in Legacy when. There's like some combo deck, and just and we just have like another match. Totally by random, way. random win condition. Yeah, um, uh, I, I actually overheard someone lamenting a loss to a Lurin a little while ago. So I'm assuming it was to Martin because I don't think there's more than one Lurin <laughs> in the room right now, and 186 players that were here today. Right. Well, especially um, if you're playing with Imperial Recruiter, those are really exactly. Hard to get too. That's why it's so uh, such an uncommon deck. But uh, so, I'll, I'll say it in a minute. We yeah, we've so actually got another match. It's game three. This is tight. These guys playing for top eight. Ian Kendall mm -hmm. on your right. Jesse Hampton on the left. Ian's playing Merfolk, Jesse playing Reanimator. Jesse, a seasoned veteran of the game. He's top eight at a Pro Tour last year. Uh, a lot of success at Magic, several uh, Grand Prix top 16s.